Well, I don't know if you've heard, but there is a sickness out there that's moving across the land. I don't know if you've heard it. Maybe you've not been following the news. Maybe you've not heard it proclaimed. No one's ever said to you or informed you that there is a sickness. And it's likened unto death. And it is one where humanity is dying daily to. And I know you're getting concerned and want to know, what is this sickness? What is this? Well, let me tell you this. It is one that starts with sleepiness and then proceeds to us feeling sort of bound up and, and an inability to move in great, great constraints. And then it is that we are finding ourselves existing in a burial place. Yes, I'm talking about a sickness within our lives that is so powerful, it restricts, it binds, it makes us fall into this place of this state, sleepiness, known unto it as a death unto its own. What is this sickness? Well, it's all about our inability to see our perfection. That's what it is. And it's illustrated so beautifully for us through a biblical text in John chapter 11. A metaphysical story that's filled with all kinds of symbolism and message for our lives that is a living word for us today. This sickness that comes into our lives is our inability to see our perfection, to see that we are created, that we are created in this perfection, living in this perfection, our world is perfection. And we're saying, wait a minute, how can this be? I look around and I see a lot of imperfection. I look around my world and I see a lot of things that don't seem to put it together. It doesn't seem like it's a perfect world. And yet that's the challenge that we're facing that drifts us off into a sleepy state, into a spiritual death, into a place that's likened unto death within the soul and spirit of our lives and takes us to the place where we feel as if we're almost buried, living, existing within a tomb within us. The Bible story of John chapter 11 unfolds for us a simple story of Lazarus and his resurrection. Jesus coming to heal. Jesus coming in a wonderful way to administer this wonderful power and presence of an awakening within our lives. And it's a scripture that speaks to us down through the ages for us in this moment. Now, what we want to share with you is that in this story, and it, to make it a little more simple, I'm going to paraphrase it for you. Let's unfold it together that Jesus receives the news. And the passage opens up of Mary and Martha telling him that their, her brother, their brother is sick. And inviting Jesus, come, come quickly, come and heal my beloved brother Lazarus. Now, Jesus, hearing the word, delays for several days. Doesn't arrive. It said that it could be three or four days before he actually comes to the place where the family lives. There it is that during this time of delay, the disciples are arguing with Jesus and saying, wait a minute, Jesus, you want to return back to Judea? Did you know that the last time you were there, there were those who gathered to stone you because of your teaching? That you were teaching this powerful, positive message of a practical spirituality for lives that was infuriating people. People did not want to hear this message. The religious leaders of the day wanted to stone you. Jesus, you want to go back to Judea? You want to go there? And Jesus shares these words that you read in today's text, the Bible lesson that you find in the back of your bulletin, saying, are there not 12 hours in a day? And if one travels in daylight, he will not stumble because he sees the light? This is so crucial for us in the reading of this passage because it sets the tone and it begins to sort of see the introduction to the teaching lesson that's offered to us by the writer of John chapter 11. For us to understand a spiritual awakening within our lives, Jesus is saying, walk in the light. Walk in the light of truth. Walk in the light of awareness. Walk in the light of understanding. For those who would say, wait a minute, I'm afraid, we're terrified, we're scared. We, you, Jesus, you can't move through this world with all the things around us that we see in the appearances of the physical. And Jesus is saying, wait a minute. Our eyes are not on the physical. Our eyes are walking in the light, seeing the light, seeing the good. So this becomes the opening statement, you might say, for the whole chapter that unfolds the story for us. For Jesus inviting then a journey of understanding what does it mean for us to walk in the light, to live in the light? 
Well, because if we're walking in the darkness, we often stumble, we trip up, we find error, we find difficulty, we find challenge within our lives. Walking in the light, we see clearly, right? The light illuminates everything within our pathway, and we have the opportunity to walk and move in a world in the realm of the spiritual, having an eye or a vision that's open and clear. Now that Jesus' disciples hear this, that Jesus is saying, my beloved friend Lazarus, Mary Martha's brother, sick, but I'm going to awaken him. Well, they say, well, awaken him, and I love this passage because there's a dialogue of such great confusion. Our story yet today, because so many people look at the teachings of Jesus with great confusion. Many people are terrified by it. Some people run from the Bible. Some people run from Scripture. Many people in the New Thought genre sort of say, we don't want to hear anything to do with Scripture or the Scriptural Bible. We just want to hear the science of our spirituality. Yet all of it unfolds through the Bible. All the great religious leaders and teachers of our New Thought journey are, have all found spiritual truth to be their very roots of the teaching that they offer for us. It's a Bible-based consciousness. It's a base that in the truth that is found within so many different pathways. And it's all woven together. So we look at this, we find here this discussion, this argument, and that Jesus is saying, but Lazarus, I'm going to awaken him. Oh, but if he's asleep, the disciples say, just let him rest, so to speak. He'll heal just fine if that's the case. You don't need to go to Judea. Jesus says, wait a minute, let me make this very clear. He is dead. Okay, wait a minute. He's sleeping and he's dead. He's sleeping and he's dead. And you obviously, some of the clues here would say to us, we're not going to take this literally. We understand these are great metaphors. Something's happening within Lazarus that he has fallen asleep to the point of a death or that which is likened unto death. Something's happened within him that he can't see clearly. Ah, can't see clearly his perfection, the perfect state, the perfect place, that place where all things work together for good. To see life from that perspective is so crucial. Now, upon his arrival, Martha meets him and says, Jesus, I've got some bad news. It's too late. Lazarus is already dead. He's bound in grave clothes. And in fact, we buried him in the tomb and he's been laying there for four days. And Jesus offered these comforting words in an affirmation affirming statement, your brother will rise up. I love the power of affirmation. I love the power of positive faith. I love it when people speak in the affirmative, saying this is what I believe. This is my faith expressed in such power and such strength, such confidence and such assurance. I love it when people speak in that way because it's a kind of faith that's not wavering in any way whatsoever. I love it when people offer prayer treatment, when people are joining with us in prayer and believing and saying, this I believe, I affirm this. The beautiful words of Jesus with that power of affirmation brings comfort to Mary and Martha. And they understand, yes, well, you know what? This will happen someday. But no, no, Jesus is saying, this day, in fact, let us go to the tomb, roll the stone away. And Jesus calls Lazarus forth and he comes forth out of the tomb. What is the story all about? Is it a story about Lazarus' physical death and resurrection? Now, wait a minute. Do we not know that the scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die? So did Lazarus die a physical death and was resurrected to die again a physical death someday later on? You see, that wouldn't make sense, would it? Then because we see it's appointed unto man once to die. So there is a physical death of the body once in this journey that we travel in this lifetime, you see that this is the unfolding of something deeper and metaphorical within our lives that we want to tear apart the passage and say, wait a minute, I want to look deep, deep, deep inside. I want to see the truth that's hidden behind this. I want to unfold something more. I don't want to just read this literally and miss all the nuances that are there for us for our lives. Because this whole instruction, this passage and story is unfolding with the overarching theme, walk in the light. Walk in the light of awareness. Walk in the light of understanding. Walking in the light is what Jesus says. If you don't, you're going to stumble. You're going to trip up in life. And what is this wonderful understanding? It's this perfect awareness of perfection within your life and who you are as a creation of God. In this, we find that the story is then just speaking of Lazarus sleeping. 
that soul, that spirit, that consciousness that has sort of drifted away from the awareness and has fallen and sort of drifted off to sleep. Like we too get sleepy. How many of you are sleepy right now? Okay, what do we got to do to wake you up a little bit? Uh Uh-huh. We too, our eyelids get a little heavy. We drift off, you know, we sort of lose consciousness. You've gone off in mind and just found a restful peace and you listen to the lull of the voice of the pastor and you, oh, yes, okay. Uh, You know, getting a little sleepy-eyed. What we find is that we miss so much in that sleepy state where vibrant faith now loses its intensity. Our confidence and our knowing slips away as we drift off into a sleepy state and we become lulled away to sleep and our uh, sort of our consciousness dulled then. We don't see life in great clarity. We are now walking in a dimmed room or a dimmed environment in the darkness and we are susceptible to stumble. And Jesus says, wait, 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 come back, come back, walk in the light. Walk in the light. Come on, come on, wake up, wake up, wake up, and come to this wonderful awareness. Come to this light to understand that we are able to live with an understanding of innate perfection that we were created in, created in God's goodness. For we are this wonderful perfection. Now, I'm going to say this. How many of you have had birthdays? We seem like a lot of birthdays this last month, and some birthdays yet to come up. Uh, in our congregation in the month ahead. A lot of people are looking at your age in the physical realm. I want to say this. When we're looking to see ourselves in this wonderful aspect of perfection, we're not our age. We are our energy. We're not our age. We are our energy. For there's a divine energy within us. And we look at the age and say, what the physical body is this? And it's, you know, 29, right? Uh, It's, you know, it's whatever. Uh, We want to claim that age. And some of us are fearful of turning 30. uh, And we're like frightened and thinking, oh, what's it going to be like? And we focus on the physical and the age. But we're not our age. We are our energy. We are the energy of our consciousness and our awakening and our awareness. This is, this is who I am. This body is the container. That which is me is not this body that is something greater than this. And I am not my age. I am my energy. I am thy awareness, my thoughts, my consciousness. That's who I really am. Let me tell you this. You are this divine energy, in fact. For you were created in this beauty and goodness. I love it when we read this creation story over and over again. And sometimes we don't read it enough. It needs to almost be a daily experience for us. Well, we understand God created and God said, it's good. It's good. Say it with me. It's good. How beautiful it is to understand that what God created is good. And you're created in the good God energy. That's who you are. You're not your age. You are this wonderful spiritual being. You are living and dwelling in the good God energy. That's who you are, and we must not forget that. But that awakens us to the wonderful understanding of our perfection. It keeps us from moving into the world of appearances where we look at all the faults and all the failures, all the shortcomings, all the things around us, and then realize, wait a minute, I'm created in goodness, and everything about me is goodness. And the God energy within me is good, and it's good all the time. And that energy is who I am, and that soul force within me is what exists. And so I see that world created in perfection, goodness, and that's who I innately am. And when I see my world as good, and I see myself as good, I really have this confidence then in proclaiming all things work together for good. All things, no matter what the experiences may be, they all fall in wonderful order. They all happen together in a beautiful way. They all manifest in something wonderful. And you may say, wait, all things? Yes, all things. I moved into a new home two years ago. First week in, the air conditioner was shot. Friend, I just moved into this new home. Brand new experience in a home that was had some age to it, but everything was... Looked like it was operating in good function, good well in the inspection. I thought I was going to have no worries. And suddenly the air conditioner is out. What am I going to do? I had the homeowner's warning call, and they came in to take a look. And some of the people came to examine and said, well, we think it's this. And it wasn't that. 
And someone else came and said, we think it's this. And it wasn't that. And someone else came by and said, I know what it is. It's this. And it wasn't that either. And finally, they gave up and said, you know what? We've tried all these different things to fix your air conditioner. We're just going to have to provide you with a new one. Dang, a new one. All right. My homeowner's warranty blessed me with a brand new air conditioner. And we couldn't figure out why when it was installed, it didn't work. A brand new air conditioner. Well, they began to say, we need to check everything within the house, all the pipelines. They took one of these listening advices that they could listen to every single pipe to find out where, if there was some sort of leak, and aha, they found it. In the move-in process, we had a contractor come in and do some renovations in the kitchen. And he took a little nail gun and shot it into the wall, and it hit into a pipe that created a small hole with a leak which meant that all of the Freon, everything was constantly leaking out. So they repaired it and fixed it. And we looked back at the journey and said, dang, are we upset because that contractor used that nail gun and popped a hole and made a mess for us? No, we're not, except, 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 uh, we're not uh, upset at all. We're saying all things work together for good. And we look, wow, out of a whole process of someone's error, someone's mistake, suddenly we're blessed with a brand new air conditioner. Free. I love that. Just free. I love that. I said it was free. And I said, I love that even more when you see all things work together for good. That's where we're living in this awareness that says, I live in the realm of all is good. The realm of perfection. All is good. Now we have to look at ourselves in the same way when we see our own individual lives. You're perfect too, innately created good. I love that good because, you know, for some reason people would say, well, it's just good. Not it didn't say perfect, it just said good. Now, my father was a Pentecostal preacher for years in his ministry. He passed away two years ago at the age of 97. My father's best word that you could get out of him was not fabulous, was not you're fierce, was not you're excellent, you're not, uh, was not, you know, you're fantabulous. Wasn't any of these kind of adjectives. The best word he could come up with was good, good. And my sister and I would talk about it constantly and say, you know what? Well, if dad could only say, you know what? This is really great. This is fantastic. Well, it's good. That's good. Good was as best as it gets. Good was his word for perfection. Good was his word that says, yep, you've achieved it all. You know, when you got an A at your report card, he was saying, that's good. You know, you went, wait a minute, I want fantastic. I want excellent. I want jumping up and down. I want some enthusiasm here. It's good. It's good. In his world, that was perfect. And we had to realize that that's the highest word he can come up with in his mind, partly because he grew up in the old country. A Dutchman from way back when, where if you said too many adjectives, you might get a big head. So let me just use one. It's good. And good sums it all. Let's not get crazy with adjectives because we don't want you get thinking that you're a little high and mighty. We want you just to understand you're good. I love that because the scripture is unfolding for us this wonderful truth. You're good. And I take that as saying, I am good. And that goodness is enough. It's perfect created and God says it's good. Everything in this world is good and everything is you and I and the world around us and every experience we're working through because every experience we live from in our daily life is there for a reason. We drew it to us for a reason. So no matter what you're going through, we draw these things to us. We attract them. We attract them for the reason that we might be moving to our highest and best, that we might escalate up the uh, ladder and move on up to say something great is unfolding. So no matter what the experience may be that you're going through and we want to judge, this is bad, this is not so good, this is okay, eh, that was all right. And this is nice, this is good, this is fantastic. And we have all these degrees that we like to apply and all these adjectives we'd like to use. We would like to pass judgment, but I'm going to say to you, everything is there for a reason. And the reason is the unfolding of your highest and your best. Everything you're going through, you brought it to yourself. You attracted it to yourself. 
wait a minute, I'd like to think that God was doing that. God was bringing this difficulty. God brought that flat tire. God brought this blessing. God brought that sickness. God brought this uh, wonderful gift. God took this away. We're all thinking that God is all involved in all these transactions of our life, that God is removing and that God is the player and deciding when we have the choice. We have freedom of choice. We exercise choice. We choose, and in these choices, we're the ones who attract and draw to us experiences. But every experience is for your highest and best. Everything will bring, come to your life. It'll unfold in your life to bring about a purpose of the unfolding of the highest and best. In the Course of Miracles, it states that all things that unlike love will rise to the surface for the purpose of healing. So we, the goodness is that everything unlike love is rising up within your life for the purpose of healing, like molten metal being heated up and all the dross and impurities coming to the surface, that you can skim it off and have more, a greater purity in that molten metal. So it is. Everything that you're going through is this moment of, it's perfect, it's perfect. Wait a minute, these things that I'm going through, you say, Pastor, they don't feel perfect, oh, but they are. For they're there for you in the growth process for learning and experiencing and unfolding the highest and best in your lives. I can say in the journey of my own life as a pastor and in my personal life, going through all kinds of challenges that have come my way, so 42 years of pastoral ministry, I think about all the things that I've gone through, good, bad, as we might label them. We might like to call them joyous celebrations or very great challenges, but all of them drawn for the enriching and the development of my own spiritual life, I am grateful for. I am grateful for. As a congregation, next, year we next Sunday we celebrate our anniversary. How many of you remember the various floods in our old building? Yes, the leaking roof. The water damage, the disasters we've experienced through tornadoes and tropical storms hitting that facility. Yes, and we thought, wait a minute. Oh, did we stop to say, that was perfect? That was good? Because it was. Because it unfolded renovations. And we were blessed through each and every experience. How about the times that it came to a point where we were saying, wait a minute, what, where will we go next? And... Then we find an offer for someone to buy our former building for us to purchase this one that we're celebrating next week, three years in this lovely facility and being able to write a check, cash. Oh, I like that. Did I say cash? Yes, I like the sound of that, cash. Writing that out and being able to say, here it is, we, this building we were able to purchase. You see the blessing, all things working together for good, though we may label them in some way a challenge. You see, that's why it's so important that we don't fall asleep, that we're walking in the light, that we don't drift off in a sleepy state away from this realization. Every day is a good day, a perfect day, for it's the day the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice because I see the perfection in it. I see the unfolding of the goodness. I see that everything that is there is good, because it's designed for my highest and best. This is for your own good. You know, as a little kid, I can remember when I did something wrong, my father would pull me aside and said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to give you spanking, and this is for your own good. And it's going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And I would say, well, Dad, then don't do it. I don't want to see you hurt. You know, I just don't want to see you suffer. You know? <laughs> Somehow that bargaining chip didn't seem to work out for me very well. But he would say, this is for your own good. Okay, so this was their mindset of saying, I'm trying to help you for your highest and best to unfold that you understand and you learn through this process. So it is. We grasp this then awakening. If I'm walking in the light, the light is every step I take, every move I make, every day I participate in. It is good. It's perfect. And I see myself as perfect. And I see myself as the goodness of God unfolding in wondrous and beautiful ways. We find this then that we see, let's look at this story of Lazarus as it unfolds with so many beautiful metaphors for us. First of all, the name Lazarus means whom God helps. And as we look at every Bible text, the key to understanding it is put yourself in the story. You are Lazarus. That's right. 
You are Lazarus, whom God helps. That's right. Let's say it with me. I am Lazarus, whom God helps. I am Lazarus, whom God helps. That's the beginning to understand Scripture is put yourself in there because the Bible is the psychology of the soul. The Bible is Scripture is unfolding for us great truth and teaching that offers us the light for the pathway. The only way we grasp it is when we begin to see it's our story written down through the ages for all of humanity to understand. I am Lazarus, whom God helps. And how important it is that we understand that Lazarus represents the strength, the spiritual strength that comes to mankind, spiritual strength that comes through the recognition of God supporting and sustaining, the God within us supporting and sustaining us, that we can say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Through this Christ consciousness, through this awareness, through the God within me, I understand then. And how important it is, I understand I am a Lazarus. I am Lazarus whom God helps, whom God works in, who God works through. And we understand that then this Lazarus represents the consciousness or the awareness or the understanding of our perfection, of our perfection, that we're perfect, good, and full of power. I'm telling you this, that humanity has not heard this enough. And this is why we are so sick and falling asleep and moving to a sickness that is like unto spiritual death in our lives. People don't tell each other you're good. You know, how many are so quick to say something on Facebook that you're bad? Ooh, I'm going to tell you this. I look at Facebook on a daily day basis to help promote ministries and church and activities that were going on. And I'm looking down as I scroll through and so many of the comments are, you're bad, you're bad, he's bad, she's bad. This political person is bad. This thing is bad. This is the bad thing that's happening in the world. And where do we find the phrase, you're good? Humanity is not expressing this, the goodness. And I'm going to tell you this, you're good. And if you haven't looked at yourself in the mirror, you're perfect. That, and looking in the mirror of your spiritual life to see your soul in its perfection, the living essence that you are. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. I'm going to use some adjectives that are better than good, uh, even more, that go higher up. I want you, because I want you to understand that someone is telling you you're good, that I, as your minister, is telling you you're good. I see your innate goodness within you. I see the God in you. I already see the goodness, and I want to call it out. I see good in you and in you and you. I see the compassion. I see the love. I see the grace. I see the beauty expressed. And I see you in uh, this wonderful goodness that is this good God energy in you. And that energy that you've been created in says it will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't care what age you are in this physical realm. That goodness doesn't grow old. It doesn't become too ripe. It doesn't become out of date. It's not passe. That goodness is there in you, for it's innately in you. It's who you are and sustains you throughout all eternity. Your perfection is there. So when we find that we lose this consciousness of this goodness, of innately who we are, then what happens is we suffer and we fall into this point of being like Lazarus, where the world is crying out, come, Jesus, come, because... My beloved is sick. My beloved in the world around us has lost sight that they're good. A few weeks ago, we received word of a dear friend of ours. The family, uh, the wife was our veterinarian who took care of Robert's horse. They had adopted a son, brought a child from Russia and raised that boy uh, to love horses. And at every horse show, We would see him competing. Uh, Robert would ride his horse, and Colton was his name. He'd ride his horse, and he fell in love as a 16-year-old with some young girl who uh, wanted to have a different agenda for his life and said, you know, uh, I think, you know, the two of us need to run away, and uh, even at 16, and you leave school, and she was a little older, and uh, we'll set up a life together. And over the time, they had children, two children, in a matter of just uh, a few months, it seemed like. And uh, suddenly she's saying, I don't want you anymore. And he's devastated, the love of his life. You're not good. You're a loser. 
you're not worth of any value. He comes back home to live with his mom and dad and feeling defeated. He meets this young lady who invites him to join her at his family's dinner so she could introduce him to the mom and dad. And After the dinner, she calls him and says, you know, my parents just don't feel you're good enough for me. And that night, he hung himself. We live in a world that's fallen asleep and not aware of our innate goodness. And we listen to the words of the appearances around us and the judgments and the voices. It becomes a sickness that drives us into a slumber, that drives us into a state of feeling as if we're spiritually dead, void of the love of God, void of the love of humanity, void and empty of all that is of our perfection and a realization of it. And then we sometimes take those measures like Fulton did. We find in this story that Mary and Martha were like the whole world. Um, they symbolize the whole world as under this hypnotism of this material belief or the, the belief in the appearances. Mary and Martha are saying to Jesus, you know, it's too late. It's just too late. You screwed up, Jesus. You missed the boat. You didn't come on time. Had you been here a few days earlier, the whole situation could have been different. But it's just too late. I'm going to tell you this. It's never too late. Because God doesn't know time like we know time. And if it was too late in the realm of the physical world, people would, if everything would just, and that's what we live by, the, the resurrection of Lazarus would have never happened. The story says, it's not too late, no. Oh, but he's dead, and we put him in a tomb. We bound his body up and wrapped it all in. Honey, it is too late, Jesus. You know, you've done, you, you missed the boat here. It is, it's final, it's finished. And this is our world today. We are the Mary and Marthas, all, and we're surrounded by them, where we keep saying, you screwed up, you missed up, it's too late. You forgot your perfection. Yeah, well, look where you are now. You're a mess. It's just too late. But here's the beauty. Jesus said, no, your brother will rise up. He will rise up to this wonderful resurrection, awakening, a spiritual awakening. And this is the beauty for our lives that we may think, wait a minute, it's too late. I screwed up. I missed out on this. I should have known. Had I known that I was really this good and this perfect, I would have lived differently. I wouldn't have had self-doubts and fears. I might have, might have lived out self-acceptance a whole lot sooner in the journey of my life. I might have been more confident. I might have been more successful in my life. It's not too late. It's not too late. Where the spirit within you will rise and rise up. As Jesus said, your brother will rise up. For it is this wonderful awareness, then the opportunity for us to awaken is there and walk in this light. The beautiful passage of Scripture says, "Fix our eye, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. From 2 Corinthians 4.18. Our eyes move then to that which is unseen, the spiritual realm of the world around us, not the physical, not the material, but to see with the eyes of God, the eyes of the divine, spiritual insight to see the good that's all around in our world. Jesus said he's not dead, he's just simply sleeping. And the wonderful awareness is what awakens him to the I am, the I am consciousness within each and every one of us. The I am. Jesus said over and over again, I am this, I am that, I am. What were the words that were given to Moses when Moses cried out? Who do I say sent me? I am that I am, the divine within us. Jesus went to the tomb in the spirit of the I am, proclaiming I am the resurrection. Meaning the I am within us is that which resurrects us and brings us back to this awareness of our own perfection. And in that moment, Lazarus rises up and comes out of the tomb and the stones are rolled away and all the barriers removed and how important that is in our lives. But yet he's still bound up like a mummy. And they say, release him. Tear off those bandages. Tear off those bonds. 
set him free. Set him free. How important it is that we understand this? Loose him and let him go. How important it is that we say, once you're awakened, how important it is that we awaken to this perfection. Yes, and now what? You got to loose all those bounds, all those things that have held you, that have kept you back, all those sort of grave clothes, those burial garments. Remove them from your spirit and set yourself free to excel and to be that whom you've been called to be all through the ages. So we find here this beautiful story summing up in metaphor. Likened, us, likened it to us a story of our own journey where we have fallen asleep, where we have sometimes fallen into such deep sleep, it's likened unto a death. And we find ourselves in the tombs, in the graves, with stones rolled and closing us in. And words of the world around us saying, it's too late, it's too late. But today is the day of great promise and awakening within our lives that we walk in the light. It's never too late in the divine. Never too late in God. Never too late in the wonderful presence. For all things happen for a reason. Now think about it. Here's the goodness. Aren't you glad Jesus dilly-dallied, shall we say? Aren't you glad Jesus was late? Aren't you glad Jesus delayed? Because why? He was able to reveal the glory of God. And that's your calling. It's never too late, although you may say and by your judgment of appearance, it's too late. It's not too late. It's simply your opportunity to reveal the glory of God. Now is your moment to reveal the glory of God. Everything that life has given you is your moment to reveal the glory of God. Everything in your life is to reveal to the world around you. This is God alive and radiant within me. This is my opportunity. Yes, you may call it a difficult circumstances. You may call it a hardship. You may call it a challenge, but I call it opportunity to allow the glory of God to radiate, to shine, and to be seen. It's never too late. For today is your day to walk in the light and allow the glory of God to be seen. Amen.